Hi, and thank you for joining me for this uh, lecture on political ideology. And specifically what I wanna talk about is the relationship between political ideology on the one hand and this question of identity on the other hand. Uh, this discussion is the first of a three-part series, so go ahead and check out the other two parts if you're interested in, uh, in what we're covering in this video. Uh, today, what I want to talk about is the questions of identity specifically, but also how identity leads to order and structure in society. And uh, we're also going to be talking about a couple of terms, um, specifically the left versus right ideological continuum. Uh, and then future lectures, future discussions will be over things like structures, and, and then also uh, a way of trying to evaluate how we see ideology in the contemporary world. Now, as we're getting started, and, and at any time, please feel free to, to pause the video, including after these questions. But as we're getting started, it's probably helpful to ask yourself a couple of questions to help you understand a little bit about what your own political identity or political ideology might be. So first of all, if you were thinking about entering into a, a long-term relationship with somebody, maybe it's a, a future spouse or, or, or a partner, or maybe it's just simply someone you're going to be working with in a long-term relationship, what are the kinds of things that you would want to know about that person? What are the characteristics, uh, the things that might help to shape you in your relationship with that person? And then as you're making a list of these identity questions, these things that you care about, also consider which of these things are changeable or malleable, what we'll call immutable or inherent characteristics, and which of these things are kind of a function of taste or choice or, or previous history that can be changed. So a couple of examples. Uh, think about questions like where were you born or what is your sex or your race or your ethnicity? Uh, what is your faith? And I have a question mark next to faith because you know, keep in mind, while you can change religion, since religion is something that we consider to be true, many people don't want to just simply jump from, say, Christianity to Islam if they believe in the truths of Christianity, which makes it sort of an inherent characteristic. And then there are also some things that are sort of mutable or transitory, like you can develop a set of skills, but then learn or perfect those skills over the course of your life, your accomplishments, your goals for the future, the things that you want to be or you want to become. Um, also have gender as opposed to sex, since we're increasingly having conversations about, about gender being something that people try to change or variations in masculine, masculinity and femininity across different cultures. And then faith here with a question mark as well, because while somebody who is Christian may not choose to leave Christianity, there is a lot of movement within Christianity. Uh, a Baptist may become a Methodist or start attending a, a Presbyterian church. Less movement between, say, Protestants and Catholics, but that does also occur. So we have these, these characteristics that make up identity and the things that you might be looking for in someone that you're going to be living with or working with. Now, the interesting thing about identity is that the, the fact that people share identity often leads to the construction of social order around shared identity, so, something that we call social structures. Now, why is that the case? Well, because I have preferences about the identities of the people who I want to be around, and so do most of you. And as we start to come together with people who share our identities, we might also think about how we rank or preference some characteristics over others. Now, many of us might prefer diversity and want to be around lots of different people, but even that is a preference that might help to shape our social structure. Now, the result of understanding identity and our preferences for the identities of ourselves and others help us to understand that all individuals and all, so all societies have some degree of inherent bias. There's going to be some discriminatory beliefs simply because societies are going to be built around these shared characteristics. And it's fairly normal or fairly natural for you to believe that your society, your characteristics might be preferred over others. Now, this isn't necessarily an inherently bad thing. And here are a list of reasons why having shared identities in a society might be a good thing. It helps you to develop trust. It, it helps you to manage risk. Having common goals make it easier to try to problem solve or, or crisis manage. But taken too far, and the use of identity through a ranged society can lead to things like discrimination or prejudice, 
uh, it can make it harder for a person born into one level or rank in society to move to another rank in society. And, and this inability to move around could lead to things like you know, social violence, especially among the outgroups. So what does all this mean? Well, first of all, it means that because we have identity, we end up with social hierarchy as an inherent part of just about any society. But societies differ in a number of fundamental respects. So first of all, how should society be ordered? What characteristics are most important? Are these characteristics immutable characteristics like race or even nationality? Or are they mutable characteristics, things that we can change about ourselves, like our occupation or our wealth or our income? When we're thinking about the ideological spectrum, then, what we can understand is that as we're talking about people who are on the right side of the ideological spectrum, or if I talk about moving towards the right of the ideological spectrum, what I'm talking about is a person who has a stricter, more hierarchical structure to how they believe that society should be organized. And as I get far to the right, what I begin to find is that these structures, these identities that build structures, tend to be the immutable or inherent kind. So when I think of a, of a fascist political system, I think of someone who builds a state around nationality or the ideas of race. Now, as I move further and further to the left, what I start to see are political ideologies built around identity, but where the goal is to create a common or shared identity or to make all identities as equal as possible, or such that there is a hierarchical structure to build identities where we're really concerned about mutable characteristics, things that I can change about myself. So if I'm born into a lower class or a lower status, then I have the ability of rising out of my status through the use of opportunity that's are available in society. So how does this help us to understand the American political system? Well, there's a term that was very popular when I was a little bit younger, but, but isn't something that we hear quite as often anymore. It's called WASP. It stood for White Anglo-Saxon Protestant. And then we would frequently add male or wealthy to the end of that, WASP-M or WASP-MW. The argument was that as a society, our culture was founded based upon the descendants of, of the British colonies, with some sprinkling of Germans who were also Northern European and also obviously of Germanic descent. The result was that our culture, our society had this early preference for white European, particularly Northern European cultures that practiced Protestant Christianity, and also a preference for wealth as opposed to, to class, which was more the case in Great Britain. Now, while it's true that we started out as this right-based society, what's also true about American history is that we have had this consistent leftward drift over the last 200 years. Here's one example of what I'm talking about. Thinking about the, the voting rules as they existed in 1792 as compared to today gives you a pretty good insight of how the American political system has been drifting to the left over the last 200 years. 200 years ago, if you wanted to vote, you basically had to be a wealthy landowner. You had to be white. You had to be male. You had to be at least 21 years of age. And we had built in our society a political structure that reinforced these identity, these cultural characteristics. Now, over time, that's changed. And so certainly uh, one of the things that we can explore is how we have broadened or narrowed the social hierarchy in America. Okay, so here are a couple of questions for you to consider as you're thinking about whether you want to go ahead and move on to the second video, the third video in this lecture. First of all, think about how the American society has changed since the, since the end of the Civil War. And particularly think about how former Confederate states like Texas have changed in their broad ideological drift over the last 200 years. Voting is an example, but there are others. Something else to consider is how does the contemporary policy debate in the United States demonstrate this left versus right continuum? So think about topics like immigration, gender norms, gender roles, family structure, the Black Lives Matter movement, education policy, healthcare policy. All of these are built more or less around this left versus right structure. So think about that and, and consider that as a topic for future consideration. So thank you for watching this video. And again, I hope that you check out others in the series 
or other videos on different topics. Thank you.